Tika England mundanely. I actually go by Kjellberg, say Bjarner's daughter in the society. Um, and I'm talking today about Tentrad. Uh, let me pull my notes up here so I make sure I don't skip everything. Um, so the first question that I generally get when I tell people, oh, I'm interested in Tentrad is what the heck is it? Um, and Tentrad is, you can see I've got on my screen share, I think everyone can see this, a couple examples up. This is, uh, the tin thread that was used to make Norse posaments. So the posaments are these um, these metallic sort of knot works that were found on clothes in graves. Most of them were in Birka, Sweden. There were a couple that were out in Norway and out in Russia, um, but most of the time they, they sort of collected in Sweden. Uh, this is 9th and 10th century graves, and they were mostly on men. There were a couple women that had them in their graves, but most of the time it would be the men. Um, there are a couple different types of the posaments themselves. Uh, there's this kind, which is sort of referred, generally referred to as spiral silver. Uh, there's a sort of single silver strand type, and there's a sort of twisted single silver strand type. Uh, Really, the only one I was interested in was the spiral silver because that's the one that uses the tentrad. Um, in the graves, it was mostly found around heads, so there's a lot of thought that it was on hats or on headbands or something. Uh, it was found a lot of times in this knotwork style on belt pouches and on sort of straps and strap ends as uh, like decorations. So like. There's some that have come out that are sort of the Turk's head. If you've ever seen, you know, not work sort of around something, generally that's going to be a Turk's head. Um, and those were found sort of in places that implied this might have been strap ends or strap decoration. Um, the interesting thing to me about the Tentrad is that this gives us an interesting connection between the Sami native people and the Norse because the, we're finding this in Norse graves, but the Sami people, even modernly, still use Tentrad. Uh, they do what they call Tentrad broidery, which is tin thread embroidery, uh, and they do a lot of work sort of on almost collar-like things up here, uh, and then they, have, they also do belt pouches. Uh, I think sometimes it'll show up on their, not truly moccasins, but sort of their decorated leather boots. Um, and nobody quite knows who did this first. Was it the Norse? Was it the Sami? Um, we know that the two cultures collided or at least interacted uh, because there is mention of the Sami in the sagas, in a lot of the sagas. Well, not a lot, at least a couple of the sagas. Um, there are other sagas that don't say Sami specifically, but say like the outsiders. And so that's sort of believed to be the Sami. So we know that the Norse and the Sami interacted at least, um, but no one's quite sure who was doing Tentrad first. A lot of the research that I've seen thinks that probably the Norse started it uh, because they were more likely to be the traders. They would be able to get the silver in or to get the silver wire in. Um, there's some thought that this might have come sort of up through Turkey because there's a similar sort of wrapped wire for art form going on there that was, I'm going to get this wrong, Kazaz, Kazazlik or Kazaz. Um, I cannot find any good information on Kazaz. I've looked and looked and looked and I, of course, don't read Turkish. Um, so that one is kind of lost to me, but it would make sense that like in trading that might have come up into Scandinavia that way. Um, I, I like the theory that the Norse were probably doing it first and the Sami picked it up. Um, but again, that's another sort of amorphous, nobody quite knows things, at least nobody knows in the research that I've found sort of thing. Um, so modernly, I've given you sort of two examples of modern here in the screenshot. So the one on the black here uh, is modern machine-made Tentrad, and we'll see if I can get my, my poor phone to focus pretty well. Uh, so this is modern machine-made Tentrad. Uh, this is actually the headband, or the circlet that I wear is sort of an AOA circlet. Um, 
And this is done very much in sort of the Sammy style. A lot of the Sammy folks are making bracelets like this um, out of reindeer leather and with buttons and so forth. Um, so this is actually sort of glaringly modern application, but I can I get away with it every once in a while. I need to update and put it on a more appropriate band. Um, underneath here, this is the Tentrod that I've made. Um, this was an ANS project when I lived in Anstiora, and you can see examples of sort of the different types of posaments. Um, you can see that there is a slight color difference. Uh, this is because the materials are different. So the modern machine made one on the bottom here is actually an alloy that's more tin than silver, hence tentrod. Um, and the ones up here that I'm making are more silver, they are silver. Uh, I think these are sterling silver. I've since moved on to um, pure silver instead of the sterling. So it's, it's not a mix anymore, thinking that's what they dug out of the graves. So the, the ones that have come out of the graves have been tested to be uh, sterling silver with a silk core, where the modern is the tin and silver alloy or combination with a rayon core. Um, I got interested in this mostly because the real, the quote unquote real stuff you have to import from Sweden takes forever to get here costs an arm and a leg, or at least cost more than I thought it should. Um, and my thought process was basically, you know, they made this back in the day without fancy machines. There's got to be a way to do it. Um, so I started sort of looking into what would that way be. Uh, I know in, I think it was 2014, when I lived in the Midrealm the first time, there was someone working on this um, who was looking at using sort of piano wire in a drill and winding the metal around that and then inserting the core. Um, I tried that and it was sort of a miserable failure. You just kept pulling the, the wire farther apart than it needed to be to try to get everything in and then trying to crunch it back together. Um, there was some theory that it was like a a winding thing with like a swivel on the end and so you could sit there and wind it and wind the metal on um but in research i couldn't find anything in sort of grave sites or in tool finds from the norse that said like oh this is how we do it uh and finally my aha moment was a combination of a book that i had found uh that talked about the technique of core spinning for actual like yarn and wool and so forth, where you take a sort of a core thread and spin something around it. Um, and then at the same time, I managed to find a 1985 video. It's like a 30 second clip, if that, of a Sammy woman in, I believe, Sweden, spinning Tentrod on a drop spindle. Uh, and then I think it was uh, Disa Birka Lundi of Antir found, and I'm gonna butcher this name, uh, it's the, they call it the monster block um, that had pictures of sort of the tentrod making process in it. Uh, so between those three things, I was like, aha, drop spindle, this is how it should work. Um, so with that, let me pull this stuff out of the way and see if I can actually get the process going. This will be the second time I've tried to do it staring at the video screen instead of at my hands. Um, so we'll see. We'll see how this goes. So the materials that I have been using to do this um, are FF size silk, which let's see if I can get a good image, come on. Um, so this is FF sized silk. Uh, and I believe I bought this at Fire Mountain Gems. Uh, and it's this, I think, 100, obviously 115 yards. I have not gone through it. Uh, so this will last you a good while. Uh, I started out using silver from Fire Mountain Gems as well, but then realized that Rio Grande was a lot cheaper. Um, so this is, I think, 1.3 ounces, not a metal, I'm not really a metal person, I'm really a textile person, so the whole like how they, how they weigh, how they price metal is a little foreign to me still. Um, I believe, I want to say this is something, because they do it by weight, but then they'll also tell you how many feet this should be. I want to say this is something like 380 feet, which goes reasonably far as you do this. 
Um, it's a round wire and it's a 30 gauge. Um, and that's, I think, one of the thinnest you can get in actual fine silver. Um, so this comes on a spool, which basically just looks like that. I'm gonna undo my end so I can get, get that free. Um, as you get going on actually doing this, a lot of the technique becomes how do I keep the silver and the thread both going where I want it? And there is sort of a learning curve to that. Um, the other thing that I use, I have tried, this is my painfully authentic period drop spindle um, that I got, I'm not gonna remember her name, Lois Swales at Penzik sells them. Um, I have tried doing the Tentrod on this because this is gonna be the, the closest to the tools that the Norse actually had. Um, and what I find is that I actually need to get in and I need to notch out my notch up here a little bit more. Um, if you do wool, you can tie a half hitch around it and keep going and you're fine. Um, with the Tentrod, sort of the more kinks you put in it at the get-go, the harder it is to turn into that knot work pattern later. Um, so I actually just need to get in here and notch that out, notch that hook out a little bit more so my Tentrod will stay in there. Um, but when I started, I was using my ridiculously modern spindle. I think this is a shocked high-low. Um, and I use it in the high formation, so my tentrod will come off of here. Um, so the first thing that I do to get going is tie essentially just either an overhand knot or a slip knot or something in the end of my end of my silk. Basically, I just want a loop. I discovered doing this the last time that the loop then wants to close up on itself. Makes it really hard to get the hook of the drop spindle in there. Um, I'm going to hook that on the drop spindle, maybe. If my knot would stay, it would be delightful. There we go, that time for the charm. So I'll hook, it, I'll hook the loop on my drop spindle like that. Come on, phone, I believe in you and your focus. Um, so I'd hook it on that just like that. So I have a loop and then I can put some tension on the, on the, the thread on the other end. Then I get going with my wire and I tend to start it back behind the knot. So if that's my knot, I'll do sort of one or two wraps behind the knot just by hand, just sort of lock it down. And then this is the part where people are like, well, duh, of course that's how you do it. I tend to hold tension. I'm gonna to try to give you the hand position that I use. I tend to hold tension on my silk core thread with sort of my back two fingers and then I'll guide the wire in with my sort of front two fingers and it's literally just a game of spinning this nonsense in. You can see I'm not getting a good spin right now. I'm just sort of undoing my my lock in down here. It takes a couple tries sometimes to get this going. Come on. It's always something when you're trying to look like someone who knows what they're doing online, you know? There we go, okay. So as soon as I get sort of out away from my little tail, you can see that really all I'm doing is turning the drop spindle with this hand and let it just sort of guiding the wire up the silk on the other. Um, if you can see, I don't know how close I can get you there and still get it in focus, but you can see that the wire is not solid at this point. That's step two. Um, decide which of the fingernails on your opposite hand you don't like, and you basically crimp down above the wire and pull it all back. So now I've got out of that, you know, two or three inches that I had spun up, I have about a half inch of actual tentrod. And then, we do the whole thing again. So you continue on spinning up. It's a game of basically spin it up and pull it back. Spin it up and pull it back. Spin it up and pull it back. Um, and once you get sort of where you want to be, if you have once you have enough, or once you run out of either silk or metal, um, you can just take the whole thing off and sort of use it as is. You can see in there. Come on, focus. Focus like you like me. Um, so you can see in there, sort of that inch is what I've, what I've made here. Um, and you can go, basically the length is determined by how much of the materials you've got. So this is a length that I've done before, um, and just sort of a big long run. Uh, this is probably about eight feet. 
The thing to remember is that when you use these, use this on posaments, um, a lot of the times it is doubled. So you want to make sure that, you know, if you work it out and your posament needs, oh, you know, 20 feet, you actually need 40 because it's going to be doubled. Um, let me pull this off the drop spindle here. Uh, when I get enough, I'm going to do sort of a Martha Stewart, like pretend I've just spun eight feet. Uh, when I get enough, I'll take it off the draw off the hook of the drop spindle, the loop. A lot of times I'll run the loop sort of up the end of the spindle so it sits up here. And then I'll wind this on just like you would with wool. Um, there's an art sort of an art form to you've got to cross it over itself enough times that it'll hold, which sometimes is the hard part. Um, and I tend to not wind very tightly because you can see this stuff will want to obviously hold a crimp. Um, if you so if you wind it too tightly, you'll wind up with this just sort of like spiral, spiral ten trod the whole way down. Um, in essence, that is pretty much it, I think. Um, I am happy to field questions. I'm happy to field comments. Um, I'm happy to field, but what do you do after that sort of things. Um, like I tell people, this class is usually about 10 minutes of me talking, about five minutes of me doing, and about two minutes of everyone going, well, of course that's how it's done. It's so obvious. So I think you can, I think everyone is muted at this point. I don't know if I can unmute you or if you, if you can unmute you or feel free to just chime in in, uh, in the, the text box. There's someone. Ah, it was great to see. You are most welcome. Um, like I tell people, like as soon as I show you, you'll, you'll have it. It's a pretty straightforward idea. Questions, comments, requests. I can stand here and do a funny dance. <laughs> um, feel free also, if you want to see this done, um, I'm in the Lexington, Kentucky area, so my, I tend towards sort of the southern end of the mid-realm. Um, but if you want to see me do this live, I'm also happy to like bring it to events once we start having events again and actually sit there in front of you and do it because I know some people really need to just like see it even better closer up. Um, I tried with the black background here, but sadly silver on white is still pretty, pretty similar. The good old heraldry colors that all come out the same. All right. Um, so if anyone has any questions, last call. Otherwise, I will hand it back over and everyone can have a great night. Um, there's a question in the chat for you. Ah, don't do drop spindle. After <laughs> you wind it, how do you build, how do you continue on? Um, so if I were to, sadly, I don't have, I don't have that level of Martha Stewart set up. Um, but if you say, I have one here with a little bit of end. I'd have all of this kind of wound on down here. Um, and you can see up at the top here, I have a transition from metal to silk. Um, so sort of similarly to spinning, you get to a point where it's, it is what you want it to be. So it's yarn to a certain point and then it turns sort of back into where the yarn is connected to fluff. This is a very similar idea. So this is, metal up to a point and then it's just silk again. Um, so from here where that metal metal and silk join is, um, hopefully my metal would still be connected. It wouldn't have snapped off. That do It does happen sometimes. Um, but I would just do sort of what I did at the beginning again and either like wrap it back on uh, and just keep going from there with the same technique. Um, or I would have it connected and I would just keep going. I think there is a, so this is a, if I can get it to show up well, this is a sort of join. This is a metal broke join where I had to sort of stick the two ends together. Uh, it's not pretty, but in the posaments a lot of times you can sort of hide that in the knot work. Um, and this one is sort of an, it broke and I left it there kind of join. Uh, so really, I would probably go back and wind those little ends sort of farther in or just clip them off. 
I was going to try to find, do I have an ugly join in one of the posaments on this coat that I hid? Or did I hide them all too well? I think I hid most of them too well. <laughs> this is what happens when you're doing ANS posaments. No, I think I, I think I hit all of those a little too well. But you can see sort of in the knot work here, like there are definitely chances to do a, you know, if you have a gross spot and you have to pass this under, um, then that under spot is a great place to sort of hide your, your gross rejoins. Um, just what makes a posament a posament? Uh, well, the term posament is actually French. Um, and I believe that's, um, I believe that is, as far as I'm aware, it's a sort of overarching term that is sort of the spun cord decorations that is generally like trims. I think these days we think of posaments a lot as sort of upholstery trims. Um, and I think this got that name because it looked similar and the French were the first to find it or the French were the first to try to give this a name or someone knew the term and said, oh, this looks like that. Um, so if you Google posaments, you will sometimes get that. If you Google Norse posaments, you will generally get this. Um, I don't know if there is a consensus on what makes a posament a posament. I think one of the big uh, determinators in that, determinators, determiners, one of the big um, indicators of it being a posament is that it's come from a Norse grave. Because um, there are sort of three, as I said, sort of the three different types of posaments, and then there are a couple other sort of outside of that when you get into like the animal forms and like the, the wires holding mica chips and sort of all of those. Um, so I think what makes a posament a posament in this setting is it's something metallic, clearly decoration or clearly decorative um, that came out of a Norse grave or a grave presumed to be Norse. Um, I wanted to drop a couple of names on people too. Um, so since I didn't touch on any of the knot work, the actual like knot tying on this. Um, oh yes, yeah, someone else has just chimed in. If Googling you want posement, P-O-S-E-M-E-N-T. Um, if you're interested in the, what well, as I said, the monster book with the pictures of this being done, um, it was Honorable Lady Disa Birkelundi, who's in on tier. Um, and then if you want to look at the knot tying, the best one that I've seen online is Meister and Catherine Hebenstreit's of Dragon Ball. Give me a second and I will type, I will type both of those in so folks can get that. So... Uh, and oh, I left an E off of Meister N, but the idea is there. Um, and really at this point, uh, enough people are interested in this and are doing the, especially the not work part of this, that if you do Google Posament, their Norse Posament creation or Norse Posament SCA or some combination of those words um, that you will find this. Um, what other uses for metal wire in the medieval Nordic context? Um, other than decoration, we are out of my wheelhouse. Uh, I am a textile person. Um, I, she's cutting, I'm not sure. Uh, <laughs> I always look at this stuff and I'm like, this would make an excellent cheese wire. Um, so I, would, I will send you to your friendly neighborhood metal worker on what other uses for metal wire were there in the Norse context. Um, oh, one of the other things I also wanted to mention was that a lot of times, see if I can dig it out from under the table, um, Look at this. I was like, I'm almost done talking. I'm going to keep talking. Um, a lot of times people will ask me, can you do it with uh, like floral wire or sort of craft wire? You can. It is not easy. This stuff has a lot more memory um, and, a sort, and a lot harder. So this is a, like a dead soft silver. Um, so it's really flexible and it'll sort of let you do that spiral. 
Uh, this stuff is not as flexible as this is. This is also, I think, a much, not a much bigger gauge, but it is a bigger gauge. Um, when I first started, I was like, I'm not gonna pay for silver. Who's got that kind of money? Turns out I do. Um, <laughs> but I tried this stuff and it is not, it's not fun. Um, it takes so much control to sort of get it to do the spiral uh, that you're, you, like you get you basically get hand fatigue because you're, you're you're like hauling down on both ends of it so hard um, and it doesn't it doesn't do that compact motion nicely uh, you could try this but I would I would say just go for the silver or go for something softer off from the get-go uh, because if you try it with this you're gonna be like she's a liar this isn't possible I, there's no way this this is done um, there was also, I know I've, I've been doing a mine with silver because that was sort of the predominant metal found. There were a couple of graves that did have gold posaments in them. Um, that's the one that now I'm like, who's got the money? Uh, I have not yet tried gold, but it's another softer metal. So it would be, it would be another like very workable one. Um, there's something else I was just thinking. Oh, one of the ways that I've thought about trying to teach this idea of core spinning Honestly, usually with the silver, people people see it and people are like, oh, I get it. This is this is pretty intuitive. Um, is going back to sort of the idea of core spinning. And so it's handing someone yarn and some some fiber and having them like wrap the fiber around the yarn. Um, so if you're really, if you really ham-handed and you're like, I don't want to touch the silver until we get there, um, that actual like core spinning technique would be a good, a good way to start. Um, Oh, the other thing I was going to say is on prices, I keep jumping back and forth here, prices of gold and silver, um, since we're in a recession, they have gone down. Um, so now is the time if you want to do it. Uh, I think this, this whole like 300 yards, 300, 400 yards of this was like 30 bucks on Rio Grande, which is a, a, an amount, but is not, you know, the 60 bucks that I have seen it go for when silver was really, really high. Um, so there was some wire thread already made. If so, what do I suggest? Um, I'm assuming that's a question on the imports, um, on the imported Tentrod. Uh, there are a couple different places to get the imported Tentrod if you want to just sort of start with that. Um, I, I think I found this stretch on Etsy. There is, I believe now, a place that just just only like imports Tentrod. Um, I want to say it's like Tentrod.dk or Tentrod.se um, or it may even be Tentrod.com. I'm not sure. Uh, but there is a place that basically like this is all they do now because people in the US have gone, well, heck, wait, I want that. <laughs> Um, I think when you buy it pre-made, it comes in a, a variety of different sizes. I honestly cannot remember sort of what, what this one is. Um, what I would suggest is to pull up some pictures of the actual posaments from the grave sites. And a lot of them will have sort of inches marked near them. Um, so you'll be able to sort of look at um, what looks right. Any more questions? Happy to dance until people ask more questions again. <laughs> ah, yeah, Mrs. Disa has, has info on that. Um, I think if everyone here is not mid-realm, um, I know in Anstiora, uh, can I remember their name? Hextilda Corbett is your sort of posament expert down there. Uh, and they, I think they have not done, they have not done the making on this level, but they've done a lot of the knot work. Um, are there good, some good pretend threads or wires that's domestic and cheaper? Um, nothing that I have found that gives you exactly the same look. There are things that will get you sort of close, um, but they either don't have the right sort of spring to them or they don't have the right sort of texture. Uh, let me see if I can 
if I can magic some stuff out of the thread collection fast. Uh, so this is this is something I've looked at trying to use, which is sort of at least at least it's textured. Um, so you can see this is again camera is going to fight me the whole way. Um, so this is just sort of a textured gold thread. Um, and like there's there's some of the real stuff. So it'll get you, you know, close. It's about the right gauge. This will be immensely harder to do the knot work in because it won't resist you and sort of hold on to itself the way the real stuff will. Um, this is a Krennic Metallics medium number 16 braid. Uh, and this only has 10 meters on the spool. Um, Krennic Metallics does a lot of good sort of faux me metallics and faux metallics if you're looking for that. Um, and do I know where the other thing is? There's a, I don't think they make them anymore, but I used some wired, uh, it was like a wired embroidery thread that acted, it wasn't exactly the same, but it was similar. If you want to hold one second, I think I've got a, I think I've got a, an apron dress with that on it that I can pull out fast. So this is a, oh, can I even remember who makes it? Um, I think it was DMC and it's a wired metallic embroidery floss. Um, so it has a wire in there and you can sort of bend this and you can sort of see that. Uh, if you're familiar with sewing, let me get it back in the camera. Um, if you're into sewing, you'll sort of recognize the outer layer there as a lame. Uh, I made this because it's basically plastic and I can throw this whole thing through the washing machine if I want. So that is a DMC wired floss that I don't think they're making anymore. Um, that again, that's that compared to the real stuff. Obviously it's a little chunkier, but at a distance, it's not too bad. Um, how does one secure the metal thread to the cloth? You sew it on. Um, I think I did a real, like a way too good, uh, way, uh, da, da, da. I did way too well at hiding my stitches on this one, but you can sort of see like there's a stitch there. Um, there's a stitch there. I, a lot of times will try to sew them down sort of under the Passovers so you don't see it. Um, on the real one, it becomes a little, on the real stuff, it becomes a little more obvious. Um, so in there you can see like stitch there, stitch there, stitch there. Uh, the game on this is match your thread color as best you can uh, and then smack people that get close enough to tell you that you've done it wrong. <laughs> Essentially, if you can see my stitches on this, like, you're too close to me. Unless I really like you. Yeah, 10 foot rule. <laughs> Which is, that's sort of, that's sort of, this is my 10 foot rule too. Is it like, I can take this to war and I don't mind what happens to it. Um, because you can see on the, on the real stuff, like, that's one of the drawbacks of the actual silver is that this will tarnish. Um, so the big fancy coat doesn't generally go to war, whereas this, this can, and I don't mind. Um, you may still be able to find the DMC wired metallics on like eBay or Etsy or something like that. Um, but I know I had people run around town and like collect as many of them as I could, uh, when I heard that it was, it was going to disappear. So you might make it out of back stock, but I know they're not making it anymore. Any other questions? Someone said I knew my stuff, they are right. Well, thank you. Um, I have tried teaching the actual knot tying. That's, that's where I fall apart. I'm good at the teaching the making. I'm bad at teaching the, the making from the making because I, I worked on boats and I worked in thread and I worked on that for so long that knot tying to me is just second nature. So if someone's like, what do you mean a clove hitch? And I'm like, I don't know, it's a clove hitch. You just do a clove hitch. So that's why I tend to, I tend to tell people like, I can, I can teach you how to make 10 trod, but then I'm going to send you to someone else for the knots. Awesome. Well, thank you guys all for spending 
40-ish minutes with me tonight. Um, I hope this was helpful. Again, feel free to like get in touch with me, um, Facebook, Instagram, email, smoke signals, SCA mail, however. Um, I'm always happy to sort of share what I know or share what I would guess would be best practices. Um, I'm also always willing to hear, you know, here's, here's more information that you didn't have that you should know. Like I'm an information sponge as are most of us. Uh, so with that, have a great night. Um, have a great rest of your week and stay safe. Thank you all so, so much. <laughs>